Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to this evening's panel event on fighting contemporary anti-Semitism online. Um, thank you all so much for joining us and for giving up your evening. Um, we really hope that this evening's discussion will be really thought provoking and insightful for you. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, we are recording the session, um, but we would stop the recording before the Q&A section just for sort of privacy reasons. Um, so if you do have a question at the end when we sort of pause for a QA, and a if you either want to raise your hand and we will ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question, or if you're feeling a bit more shy, um, you can pop your question in the chat function. Um, so to introduce myself, some of you may know me, if you don't, um, I'm Evie, I'm an English student at UCL, I'm also a writer for Pi and their social media officer, um, but I guess more relevant to tonight's context, I am an ambassador for the Holocaust Educational Trust, um, and I am also joined by two fellow wonderful ambassadors, um, Billy and Alfie, and they are going to help me form the basis of tonight's discussion. Um, so to just briefly outline the sort of things that we're going to discuss this evening, um, a good chunk of our time is going to be spent talking to you all about our experiences of being ambassadors for the Holocaust Educational Trust or HET, which we're probably going to refer to um, a lot as for this session, Joe, just for, for you to know that. Um, examples of the sorts of work we do, the kinds of projects we do. Um, and then leading on from that sort of our experiences of tackling anti-Semitism on social media platforms in particular, and also thinking about the way it's presented in the news. Um, and then finally, just touching a little bit on survivor testimony, um, because this is a hugely important thing to our work and to the work at HET. Um, and I think in the current context of, you know, everything being online, we've kind of realised the incredible nature of our survivors and the way that they've adapted so incredibly to the current climate. So I think that's definitely worth touching on. Um, and then we're going to have some time for questions. So if you do think of any questions throughout the session, please feel free to pop them in the chat or you can ask them at the end. Um, so enough of me rambling. I will now let Billy and Alfie introduce themselves to you. So Billy, if you would like to start. Hi, everyone. My name's Billy Sumner. Um, I'm a civil servant and I work for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, prior to that, I've also worked for uh, an MP called Louise Ellman, who's a Labour Party MP, um, and she resigned just before the 2019 general election, citing um, anti-Semitism in the party is one of the main reasons why she left. Um, like Evie and Alfie, um, I'm an ambassador. I'm actually a regional ambassador for the London area. Um, I've been that since 2019 and I've been an ambassador since 2013 when I did my lessons for Auschwitz, which is um, a key component and project to becoming an ambassador for the Holocaust Educational Trust. Thanks. Thank you, Billy and Alfie. Uh, thanks, um, Evie. So yes, like um, Evie and, and Billy, I'm also um, a Holocaust Educational Trust um, ambassador. I did um, the... Uh, the um, Holocaust, I sort of, you know, first uh, sort of got involved with Holocaust Educational Trust, like Billy, um, in 2013. So it seems like uh, quite a long time ago now. And I sort of more, more, more recently um, have become more active. And um, you know, I'm I'm currently um, studying part time at, at UCL as a as a as a history student, and I'm also um, about to start work um, a new job in a in a secondary school. So I kind of both of these sort of experiences were somewhere that I think. I wanted to sort of bring, um, kind of bring the sort of message of of, um, of, HET, of the Holocaust Educational Trust, um, and hopefully, yeah, tonight I'll be able to sort of talk a bit about why, you know, what what it was that kind of made me want to sort of get get back involved after quite a long, um, you know, a long time after I'd originally sort of first been involved with with HET. Thank you, Alfie, and thank you so much to Billy and Alfie for joining us this evening. I am incredible, great, incredibly grateful to you, and I know that everyone else will be as well. Um, so to kick off with sort of grounding, I guess, our roles as ambassadors, um, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the Lessons from Auschwitz project, which, like Billy mentioned, is the main sort of route into becoming an ambassador for the Trust. Um, so to touch a little bit about on LFA, so it's a four part program, which you usually undertake in sixth form. 
Um, so it involves sort of educational sessions, learning about pre-war Jewish life and the kind of events that um, preceded the Holocaust and the run up to the Holocaust. Um, and the main component of LFA is a visit to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, and then after that, you are required to do a next steps project, which is essentially a project that you carry out, um, I guess, kind of relaying the lessons that you personally have learnt through doing your lessons from Auschwitz project. After completing your next steps, you then automatically become an ambassador for the trust. And then it's sort of up to you how much work you do for the trust. Um, so like Alfie mentioned, you might take a few a bit of a time out um, or like me, I kind of took a few months off to do my A-levels and um, because that was kind of all I was thinking about at that time. And then when I got to university, I kind of decided, right, I think this is a good time to really kind of invest myself in this work. Um, so I wondered if Billy, I could start um, with you to just sort of ask you what your motivations were for doing the Lessons from Auschwitz project and kind of where your interest in Holocaust education sort of first began. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess with Holocaust education, um, you know, as a kid, you grow up and um, you sort of you know, get taught about it at school. I'd probably say I first sort of became consciously aware year nine. So about 13, 14, and then, um, you know, history has always been a subject I've been passionate about, I studied it at university. Um, but yeah, I think just learning about it in school, and then um, I think around year 12, we had to do a project on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism across Europe, and fortunately I was selected to do the um, Lessons from Auschwitz project, um, which gave me a really good sort of insight into anti-Semitism and how, you know, the Holocaust wasn't just a one-off event, there were events leading up to it, anti-Semitism has been sort of riddled um, within society throughout history. It wasn't just a case of five, six years where it happened, you know, it's so much bigger. And I think that's part of, um, you know, what really made me understand it. And I think that's where I've been privileged enough. Um, so the survivor I heard speak was a man called Ziggy Schiffer. And um, just hearing his story and, um, you know, I think prior to that, I'd went on a school trip to Auschwitz, but actually hearing a Holocaust survivor in his words tell what tell us about what happened to him. And, you know, I think at that time he must have been in his mid 80s. So I think he's in his 90s now. Um, but, you know, to be still getting up after what he's been through and telling his story, I think, you know, if that doesn't res resonate with you, I don't know what will. And I think from that moment, it's sort of, clicked with me a bit that um you know these problems in society you know 1945 was the end of the second world war and the liberation of many concentration camps and you know it does you know anti-semitism is something that still exists within society and as well as other forms like islamophobia homophobia sexism and you know i think we all have a responsibility in this call and you know to speak out against it i think that's just somewhere would um after hearing ziggy shipper speak it's something that really resonated with me it's something which I'm quite passionate about and that's why I'm on the call here today. Thanks Billy. Yeah I too heard Ziggy speak at Lessons from Auschwitz and honestly it, it was a point in my life that that just changed my outlook completely. I think you know Ziggy, Ziggy was himself um, in Auschwitz-Birkenau when he was really young and yeah his resilience his determination the fact that he was still stood for you know for an hour talking to young people who were clearly so invested in what he was saying I just think he's absolutely incredible and Ziggy's message as well is so sort of grounded in the present and I, I think urging young people to stand up against all forms of discrimination like you mentioned I think a lot of of the survivors that we hear speak are really so passionate about um, tackling hate today. You know, even though the Holocaust happened so long ago, like you say, these problems are still deeply rooted in the contemporary um, world. So yeah, thank you for that, Billy. Um, and the same to you, Alfie, I guess, just sort of what motivated you um, in your journey with Holocaust education. And I guess, yeah, like you mentioned, what was it that made you kind of get more involved after having a period um, of, of being not so involved with HET? Thanks, um, Evie. So yeah, so I mean, similarly to, um, to, to Billy and, and, and Eva, I did the lessons uh, from Auschwitz project. Mine um, was in November uh, 2013, where I, I traveled, um, I think, um, 
uh, in our uh, A level history class, we were just sort of asked, you know, the normal to sort of get, um, you know, we were sort of told about the project was sort of, um, there was two spaces and we were encouraged to kind of apply to, to, to go for it. And as, you know, at the time, as now, I'm sort of, you know, really sort of passionate about history and interested um, in history. And I think I'd, you know, also um, sort of growing up in, with the sort of, um, I guess the sort of the public sort of memory almost of, of the Holocaust, maybe the, you know, some of the sort of um, presentations in sort of film and sort of uh, literature, you know, that those kind of things that sort of had really resonated with me. So I guess, um, you know, that's what sort of initially sort of drew me to to, to Het. And then, um, so I, yeah, I also went to, to Auschwitz and how which was a very, um, it was a, a very sort of eye-opening, but also sort of surreal and difficult experience, I would say. I mean, particularly given um, there's something sort of about, I mean, Avi and Billy, I'm sure, had a sort of similar experience, but it's, um, you sort of go very, very early in the morning, you sort of go and get a plane um, to, um, to to Poland and, and you're sort of there for, for a day, a sort of very sort of emotional day, and then you come back that, that same evening. And I don't think I've ever been quite so flawed by a sort of single day as I was as I was then, but um, and and as even Billy said, really um, sort of listening to a survivor talk is, I think, what probably the most important part of of Het. And I listened to um, a talk by uh, Kitty Hart Moxon, who's um, uh, another sort of survivor who had um, survived in Auschwitz for, for for two years. And I mean, really, sort of again, just sort of echoing what what, what the other guys have said. It's sort of uh, if you have the opportunity to. Um, to listen to a survivor speak, then I really, really encourage you to, to to do so. I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this a bit later, but we're, you know, our sort of people, our generation, we're sort of, unfortunately, you know, we're going to be one of the, the last people who will be able to hear survivors, you know, seven, 75 years um, or 76 years now since the liberation of, of Auschwitz and, you know, the, the, the people people are aging who, who, who survived that experience. So I would, would really encourage everyone to, you know, to, to make sure that you do that. But, um, but yeah, to sort of go, to go on from, from that. So after I, you know, I did the LFA, I did my next steps, which um, for me involved sort of writing an article about uh, my experience, which got published in the, you know, local newspaper. So I sort of did that. I was sort of talking to my friends, talking to people. Um, but then, you know, sort of like, I guess life got in the way, you know, um, you sort of know how it is. I guess I went off um, to university and while I was still sort of interested in, in HET and in the work they were doing, and I, Sort of got their the sort of was on their email list and was sort of checking out what, what they were doing. I think um, uh, maybe the emails were sort of a, a small kind of like reminder of what that I wasn't um, you know actively involved. Sort of you know just sort of me sort of seeing them and just been like oh, I'm not sure quite sure I have I have the time. But I mean I think this sort of for me this changed um, quite recently really probably sort of last summer last sort of autumn time during the the, the lockdown um, and I just left um, sort of my full time job to, to to come to UCL and to study for my master's and it kind of gave me a bit of a chance to sort of and um, you know after sort of having done a sort of quite intense degree for three years and having worked in and a sort of quite intense full-time job for two years I was sort of like okay now I can sort of reflect and I sort of thought that you know I really did want to sort of be more actively involved in it and the main reason for that was anti-semitism seemed like uh, so much more in the public eye than I think it had done sort of previously now I don't want to sort of uh, you know, so that when I did um, the LFA in 2013, there was no such thing as anti-Semitism, which is, you know, obviously that's ridiculous. Um, I think uh, possibly I was in a different place in 2013. So I, you know, grew up in quite a, a fairly small town. I don't think I had, to my knowledge, met a Jewish person until, um, you know, I went to university. So I wasn't really aware of anti-Semitism anti that much. I sort of, you know, wasn't really that educated about it or knowledgeable about it. But then you know, in the past um, few years, I think it's really become much more of a of, of an issue um, in terms of its sort of public profile. And I think, unfortunately, led to a rise in anti-Semitism. It's almost a vicious cycle. The more anti-Semitism is talked about in the media, and sometimes the the more anti-Semitism that that itself creates. Um, so, you know, I mean, I guess that's that's really what sort of been motivated me to sort of get get back involved and you know, sort of really sort of use. Um, sort of my sort of privileged position as, as Billy said as being someone who, who's completed the LFA to, to really sort of spread the message um you know that that, that anti-semitism is unacceptable and it's also you know unfortunately um it is coming it, it is rising um again in society uh, as is other forms of discrimination so you know we've all got a responsibility to do something about that I think 
Thanks, Alfie. And yeah, I I definitely agree about what you were saying about visiting Auschwitz. Um, because I think, you know, you can read about it, you can study it in history, but until you actually stand there and you kind of experience it, there's nothing quite like it. And it's it's quite a haunting feeling. And I think, you know, what you said about um, you get up at like 5 a.m. to go and catch a plane and you do it all in one day and it's such a whirlwind. And for me, the effect of going didn't actually hit me until the day after. I remember sitting in a class at sixth form and I just got hit by like a wave of sadness. And I and I just thought of, I, I think then, only then did I sort of realize the gravitas of what I'd experienced. Um, and yeah, it was a really life-changing experience. Um, and I think, like you say about hearing survivor testimony, I mean, I'm absolutely floored by the way that so many survivors being in their late 80s, early 90s have mastered Zoom and have been able to deliver so many sessions for us, you know, giving their testimony, um, giving their testimony to ambassadors, to schools, to colleges, to people in the workplace, um, to the government. I know that um, the prime minister actually heard a survivor speak um, via Zoom on Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, and their adaptability and their commitment is, is just incredible. And I think, you know, if they can give their testimony so in such an unwavering way, like they can, you know, that it's so easy for us to, to kind of keep their message and, and promote that. And there are definitely, um, there are recordings of survivor testimony on HETS website and their YouTube channel um, have been done fairly recently with Holocaust Memorial Day. So if anyone in the audience is looking to hear survivor testimony, I would definitely recommend doing so. There are there are lots available now. Um, great, thank you guys. Um, so I wondered if we could move on to talking a little bit about one of the projects that we've all been involved in, um, sort of to contextualize some of the work we do as ambassadors. Um, so, Towards the end of 2020, Billy, Alfie and I undertook work on a report into anti-Semitism in football for Lord John Mann, who is the government's advisor on anti-Semitism. Um, so a group of us ambassadors kind of embarked on a few months worth of research into lots of different European countries, including the UK, um, looking at examples of anti-Semitism in football, um, any ways that that was rectified, any kind of good practice and punishments given, um, things like UEFA and the way that they've adopted um, IRA, which is the International Declaration of Antisemitism, the definition. Um, and yeah, I, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about that because I know for me personally, antisemitism in football was just not something I'd ever thought about. I know, I think racism in particularly towards um black players and players of color is quite prolific in the media um but anti-semitism in football was something that i've not really seen a lot about um so i wondered i can pose this one to you billy um was there anything in particular that struck you um as surprising or shocking in the football report and was there any kind of one example or piece of evidence that you really remember um i think just sort of um like my own knowledge prior to doing the project um i support liverpool and um i think in the run-up to the 2019 champions league final when we played tottenham hotspur who have like um you know renowned for having sort of a jewish fan base um so i didn't see so seeing in the lead off online sometimes a few people like sort of referencing maybe liverpool fans should bring palestine flags and you know whatever you think about conflict that has nothing to do with tottenham hotspur but it's just sort of to antagonize fans there and you know, I think after Liverpool beat Tottenham 2-0, um, I think George Galloway, who I think he actually supports Manchester United, even though he's from Glasgow, um, he put out a tweet saying at least um, an Israeli flag won't be on the cup tonight. And, it, you know, just sort of having that background, it just sort of just set up uncomfortably with me. I know a lot of um, fan groups, Liverpool fan groups, sort of condemned the statement and had didn't want anything to do with it, which was excellent. And then um, just over experience, I remember going to a Belgian football match um, with my friend. Um, it was a second division game, and um, I don't. The team's based in sort of the um, Flemish side, so you speak Dutch and that sort of part of Belgium. 
I remember just a chant and um, don't speak Dutch, but understood enough that uh, the word Jewish or was being used. Um, so I had experienced it briefly, um, but I think just this project sort of highlighted it even more, just sort of, you know, reading about how it was used. Like I looked into the Czech Republic um, and, you know, sort of understanding it from their point, like, it, you know, the term Jew, Jew was used prerogatively against Slavia Prague fans because of the game in 1920. They had a friendly with West Ham and there was an, I don't know, something to do with an insurance scam and uh, there was uh, Sparta fans who normally taunt Slavia fans um, used the phrase Jew um, and then when their fan groups were asked about it, they were like, oh, it's not anti-Semitic, it's just what's said. And I think, you know, something that went on from 1920, you know, considering as well the Czech Republic was occupied by the Nazis, um, you know, it's just horrible what happened there and, you know, it's still being used in 2000 and, well, 2020, last time I had a look. So, you know, just sort of seeing a case like that and how after all this time and what's happened, it, it's still being used and little's being done, you know, it sort of, as you say, Evie, it just really resonated with me of the scale of the problem and what needs to be challenged. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, I think it's shocking to see how many examples of anti-Semitism there are in, in something like football and actually how how little punishment there often is. Um, Alfie, I'll pose a similar question to you. Was there any particular example that you felt was particularly shocking or was there anything that you learned that you previously hadn't known um, in undertaking this report? Yeah, I mean, I'd really um, echo that, Evie, to be honest. I mean, I think, you, you know, I, I've found the, the, the research sort of, I think, fascinating but depressing. I mean, I think ultimately for every kind of positive example we found of um, good practice or, you know, um, you know, sort of things that where incidents were taken seriously, we'd find another one um, where sort of little or, or, or nothing was done. I mean, you know, similarly, similarly to, to, to you guys, I mean, I think anti-Semitism in, in football wasn't um, necessarily something I'd sort of connected before. I mean, but, I mean, obviously I was you know, whereas I think lots of um, football fans in the UK are about some of the issues around um, Tottenham Hotspur and the sort of, you know, the words that are used um, both by Tottenham fans and by other fans, um, you know, um, sort of uh, yeah, at, at Tottenham uh, games. Um, but what sort of really struck me was that that sort of um, this idea that a country, that there is a, a sort of quote unquote Jewish club in every country, um, or maybe not every country, but in a lot of European countries was was really surprising to, to me that, that that was so sort of um, ubiquitous that there was this club in which it was um, you know seen as acceptable to use um, you know the term Jew as a term of abuse um, for, for, for describing supporters of this club um, and you know I mean I think um, just really that the sort of, um, the sort of, uh, the sort of almost sort of you know the cross European kind of like nature of that the fact that there, was, you know, that there wasn't really you know I think we, we pretty much looked at every country um, in Europe and there was a, a, you know there was, there was an example in every country we looked at so I do definitely think you know football is something which people love and people enjoy I mean even even now we can't have fans in, in the stadium and you know people are still not relying on football to get them through lockdown I mean I know I, know I am um, but yeah I sort of just think it's it's really important um, that in all sort of aspects of our life and especially you know, something like something like football where people go to for for a bit of um you know a bit of, a bit of an escape from the rest of the world that they're, they're not sort of faced with this awful kind of awful language and the awful sort of anti-semitism that, that we found yeah definitely and i think it's it's an example of the kind of casual racism and anti-semitism that that kind of prevails in many aspects of life and like you say football is something that so often brings people together and that's often in every family home on the TV, um, you know, so to have this kind of awful presence of anti-Semitism, I know researching it was, it was particularly shocking. Um, and I mean, you know, Lord Mann works tirelessly on things like this um, with Premier League teams, with European League teams. Um, and there has been progress, you know, many Premier League football teams have signed IRA um, and that's been promoted me recently in the media but there is still a long way to go. Um, but I know I probably speak for both of you guys when I say that doing that report was very eye-opening. Um, and it was a privilege to be able to, to kind of contribute to something that will hopefully be very influential um, in the fight against anti-Semitism in the football um, profession. So yeah, thank you guys for that. Um, 
So that's just kind of one of the examples of the projects that we undertake. I mean, we get lots of incredible opportunities um, with HET to undertake projects um, in collaboration with them. Um, but one of our other roles as ambassadors is to represent the trust in Holocaust education and promoting the lessons from the Holocaust, um, bearing witness to survivor testimony, and also speaking out against hatred and discrimination whenever we see it. So I thought we could touch briefly on our experiences of anti-Semitism online, um, particularly ways that we have encountered this, whether we've ever tackled or challenged it. Um, and I guess as well, our advice to anyone that comes across anti-Semitism online, because I think it can be very shocking and horrific sometimes. And often you don't know what to do about it. I know that on Holocaust Memorial Day last week, um, Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, um, tweeted in commemoration of Holocaust Memorial Day and scrolling through the replies underneath that tweet was absolutely horrific. There was just some completely horrific um, anti-Semitism under that tweet. Um, and I think a lot of people see that and think, that's awful, but what do I do about it? Um, so Billy, I wondered if I could ask you sort of, what are your kind of main principles um, or processes that you undertake when you see something online? And what's your opinion on, on tackling it? You know, what are the steps that we should take um, to ensure that that is not spread more or that that gets dealt with? Yeah, um, I think first of all, just to state, you know, um, for advice with people, um, with the fact that you're attending this on a Monday evening, uh, you know, it shows that you care enough. So just thank you for attending. And, um, uh, you know, I think just for me, when I consider coming across it, I'd never go and search for anti-Semitism. Um, I did actually a presentation and work um, for Holocaust Memorial Day. And um, I just wanted, it was actually on the same topic as we're discussing now, contemporary um anti-semitism and it took me about two minutes to find a plethora of tweets just you know it's not even yeah, just awful stuff like about nazis um hitler was right and mocking Anne frank um you know it's out there and i think recently um mark zuckerberg and um i forgot the name there from twitter they've recently said they'll they're going to come down on um holocaust denial which is really good i mean it's a bit late but at least something's getting done about it Nevertheless, this still finds itself on um, Twitter. So I'd always say, like, I've had the experience when I've came across it, and um, I'd always recommend blocking it. Um, so I'll just give you a quick uh, example. So this is offline, but it might be a good way in dealing with it online. Um, so when I give my presentation and work about the um, Holocaust Memorial Day, um, somebody messaged me from work, a colleague, uh, bringing up uh, the conflict going on Palestine and Israel uh, and just asked me about that and you know I think I, the way I replied about that is just sort of saying you know it's not really the time or place to bring this up or discuss it you know there's merit in what you're saying but it's got nothing to do with the holocaust and you know it's partially anti-semitic to bring it up in the first place so, you know to sort of how you could get from that to that but um, I'd say I always try and view it in that way you know, if it's a friend or a person, you know, who's put something which you might think isn't acceptable and you could maybe talk them around. That's brilliant. I think, you know, it's well worth going that route. If it's something where you think, OK, this person isn't being, you know, intentionally anti-Semitic or isn't a horrible person, just maybe a bit confused or, you know, and you think maybe could correct them, then 100 percent, you know, try and have a word in private or whatever. Whereas if it's just sort of blatant, hate where it's just clear anti-semitism this person you know isn't going to react to anything you you'd say um i i don't know maybe evie and alfie will disagree but i think there's no point engaged and i think you pass the point and if any and you're just sort of flaring up like um you know the way the world is at the moment people kind of like that sort of got you sort of you know uh, baited you into an argument and i think the best approach in that case is just blocking and asking other people to block them um I would not engage in that. Um, but again, I think, you know, the fact that people have come to this meeting today, you obviously care. And, you know, if you're at university or whatever, you know, uh, you should be really proud of yourselves. It's a lot more than I did it when I was in, at university. So um, 
just yeah you're making the right steps and I think just also just be mindful you know assess if you can do anything in that situation and if it's a bit beyond you just block it if you um you know report it to be blocked again I've had problems you know with these tweets when you block them it takes weeks for anything to get done but at least you can do something um, yeah yeah thank you Billy I, I think that's the difficult thing unfortunately about social media is um once it's out there it's out there you know it's very very difficult to contain um I definitely agree I think the worst thing that you can do if you come across an anti-semitic tweet or post is to repost it in your reply um because that's only adding fuel to the fire you know you're only fueling the hate um and I think screenshotting um the post is a different story um if you've got evidence of that if you do decide to report it or block it or take it further that's great um, but I think definitely don't engage with it in that way. Um, yeah, I think reporting it as well. It's just doing your bit, you know, anything that you see, report it and make sure that you're kind of in that collective effort to, to, to have it taken down. Um, but I think as well, you know, one of the most difficult things in challenging anti-Semitism is having those difficult conversations with people close to you. And I think this goes for any type of racism. Um, the way in which racism manifests itself in daily life and in, in people's homes and in friendship groups, you know, we've got to remember that the Holocaust started um, with casual discrimination that then eventually built up um, to a genocide. And I think that we can never ever be too committed to calling out casual racism when you see it. So if your friend makes an anti-Semitic comment, they might not realize kind of the weight of what they're saying, you know, for somebody who is living in a world where anti-Semitism has been in our culture for centuries. Um, I think if you're, unless you're someone who's been through a journey with Holocaust education, who's listened to somebody say, yes, I was in Auschwitz and this is my story you might not have that same commitment. So I think it's our role as ambassadors. Um, and I would hope that it, it would be you, our audience's role as well to call those people out, you know, when you hear that and, and not to kind of go mad at them and, and, and kind of start shouting and screaming, but just to say, you know, did you know that what you're saying is a misconception or what you're saying is that can actually be really offensive and no, that's not quite accurate because it happened like this. I think you can always beat someone with education and you can beat them with kindness and tell them, look, what you're saying isn't quite right, but let me teach you what is. Um, so I think, yeah, you're definitely right, Billy, in, in kind of having those conversations. Alfie, I wondered if I could ask you something similar, sort of what what you feel about um, tackling contemporary anti-Semitism on social media, and I guess particularly in relation to your own personal safety and privacy as well, I think is something definitely for us to touch on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I 100% kind of echo what, what, what both of you guys, um, Evie and Billy, what you've been saying. I mean, I think um, the point you made at the start, Billy, I, th I don't think, um, you know, in this we're not expecting, you know, it's not like, okay, you've now got to spend an hour every night searching anti-Semitic terms on social media and sort of tackling them. That's your job. You know what I mean? That's not, that's not I think, what what anyone's um, saying. And I think, Evie, what, as, as you say there, you know, like, I think, um, you know, it can be really sort of like difficult, it can be really sort of mentally taxing, sort of like, you know, sort of like having to read this kind of like sort of hate, hateful comments, like obviously, you know, particularly, um, obviously, particularly if you're, if, if you're from a, a Jewish background yourself, but, you know, obviously like, you know, it can be sort of extremely sort of like hurtful and, and, and triggering to kind of like come across um, all this, all this material. And also, you know, quite a lot of this, these people who might be making these comments are going to be, um, you know, sort of, well, obviously they're going to be sort of nasty, sort of unpleasant people, but you don't, you really don't want to sort of put yourself in a position um, where, you know, that that's kind of thing is going to be affecting you because I would, you know, say it's, it's really not, not, not worth it. And, you know, they sort of don't really deserve your attention. So I think like as Elliot and Billy and Evie were saying, sort of, you know, just if it's clear that they're, they're sort of, um, you know, putting some really sort of vile, like awful stuff on there and then just block and, and move on and hopefully something will be done um by the social media company but um what, what i would say as well though just to sort of add um is i don't think it um i think it doesn't always have to be kind of reactive um in we don't always have to be reactive in our challenging anti-semitism on, on social media so 
um, you know, you, we can also do things proactively. So, say for example, I don't know, you say you follow um, someone on Twitter or Instagram, um, you know, who's sort of written sort of like a really sort of like what something you think is like a really sort of good um, kind of clear sort of debunking of some sort of common anti-Semitic myths. So, you know, for, yeah, well, you know, I mean, obviously particularly if they're, you know, they're a Jewish voice, so they're talking about anti-Semitism and how it, how it affects them and maybe, you know, sort of trying to sort of like undermine some of the myths that you see so much um, on social media, then, then, you know, maybe share share it, you know, sort of um, send it to, to people if you think that they find it interesting and just, you know, I think we really need to, when, when we talk about uh, challenging anti-Semitism online, I think we, we, we don't just mean, uh, you know, as I sort of said earlier, we don't just mean sort of going around sort of being the, the anti-Semitism police and sort of, um, you know, tackling all these individual comments. We sort of, you know, your, your kind of like Facebook or your Instagram or your Twitter are like your own little bit of the internet. And if you can make your bit of the internet sort of a place where, you know, Jewish voices are promoted and where sort of like, you know, positive kind of like um, anti-anti-Semitism messages are promoted, then I think, you know, you could probably do do a really good job in in, in terms of, you know, getting getting people's awareness up about, about this issue. So yeah, that's, I guess, the only thing I'd, I'd add. Thank you, Alfie. And yeah, you make an excellent point. I think, you know, we can all do our bit to, to challenge anti-Semitism and be proactive in kind of sharing educational resources, you know, follow HET on Twitter. They are always tweeting all about their educational resources that are so brilliant. Um, and if you can just do that little bit of educating as you go along, um, you will never, you can never underestimate the difference that you will make. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, we're going to move on to Q&A in just a moment. Um, but to kind of close our discussion, I'd just like to ask both of you, sort of directing this, I guess, more to, to our audience today, what would be the kind of the one piece of advice that you would say, that you would give to people in kind of keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive and educating people about contemporary anti-Semitism? What is the one thing that we, can, we as young people can do? Um, Billy, can I go to you first, please? Yeah, sure. Um... I think just like I mentioned previously, the fact that you're here on a Monday evening um, when I'm sure there's plenty of other things, even though with COVID restrictions, you could do. It's the fact you're here. That means a lot, you know, listening to people's stories and why I think that's key, you know, just sort of learning as much as you can and um, just educating yourself. And I think that's the key thing. You know, you educate yourself, you educate others. And I think, as Evie mentioned before, it's not a case of shouting at someone who might be a bit misguided or have a, an opinion which doesn't sit quite right. It's about sort of understanding why they have that view and going, well, actually, the reason is this reason. And but honestly, if any of you ever have a chance to hear from a Holocaust survivor, please take it up. I mean, it's not, the talks normally last under an hour and it's something that will never leave you. I've, I've been in a fortunate position where over the past eight years, I guess, I've heard several um, Holocaust survivors speak. And no matter what, none of the stories are the same, but each of them sort of have an effect on you that even today, back in 2013, I can still remember a lot of the things Ziggy Ship has said and quotes. And you, I think for me, hearing a Holocaust survivor speak is something that it won't leave you and it'll be with you for the rest of your life. And so again, just to summarise it, and I know it's not one piece, it's probably two pieces, but if you get the chance to hear from a Holocaust survivor, please take it. And the second one, just education, education, education. Learn as much as you can and help other people to understand why it is important. As Evie and Alfie mentioned, um, these survivors are probably not going to be here in the next decade or two. And then it falls on people like us to tell our children or beyond that about, you know, why Holocaust memory is important. And, you know, um, just to finish, I heard a speaker, um, I think Eve Krugler, um, last week, and she made the point that um, history will repeat itself if we don't learn the lessons from it. And I think that's up to everyone in this call and just everyone we know to just sort of take time out and call anti-Semitism or any hatred, whatever form it takes. Because without people, you know, without taking that action it won't go away so it's down to all of us um thanks for coming to the event thank you so much billy and alfie the same question to you i know we've probably said a lot of what you would say but is if there's anything you'd like to add 
Yeah, really just to, to, to echo what, what you guys have said and, and also, you know, what, what Billy said about thanking you guys for, for coming. It definitely is, um, you know, the first step to take that that kind of active role. And I know it's, um, you know, as I sort of said earlier, I, I haven't always been very active in, in how I haven't always sort of, you know, although I, uh, you know, I, I sort of um, did do the LFA a long time ago, it hasn't always been something which, um, you know, has always been at the forefront of my mind, but I've sort of made that decision. And I guess, um, you know, it's not, uh, so it sounds like, um, slightly silly, but it's like never too late to sort of, you know, take that decision to, to be an advocate for Holocaust education, I would say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, you know, obviously, um, really, I think the single most important thing similarly to Billy is to make sure that, you you know, you do um, try and hear a Holocaust um, survivor, because I, I do think that they're, the single most kind of important um, part of, of, of Holocaust education, particularly in in combating um, you know Holocaust uh, denial and, and 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 that kind of thing. That I sadly think is only going to increase. I think everything that we've seen in terms of the contemporary um, contemporary politics and the sort of um, the state of information and disinformation that we get um, at the moment with the internet and everything. I think that that would suggest to me that Holocaust denial is going to become an increasingly um, important um, problem to tackle um, across the next few generations and it's going to be down to I think incre increasingly it's going to be down to us as in people who've uh, heard Holocaust survivors rather than Holocaust survivors um, and that's, I mean uh, sort of an event that, that Evie had hosted uh, last week with John Dubai I don't know maybe some of you guys were there because it was for using university students but I think um, you know, John, it, it has has had like a sort of amazing life, and you know, sort of done so much, um, you know, with with his life after after 1945. But he's sort of still, you know, is making um that case, you know, for people to remember the Holocaust, remember what what happens. I think you know, we owe it to them to to carry on. Definitely, thank you, Alfie. Yeah, I mean, hearing from John Dubai last week again was just an incredible experience. And what he said again, what a lot of the survivors say about, you know, it's up to us as young people to challenge hate in every form that we experience it in. Um, and yeah, to carry the testimony forward um, of our survivors, I think is incredibly, is incredibly important and a great message to end with. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now.